These are new. And uh, we thank you for your word that gives us life and teaches us. And we just pray for Jane this morning. You bless her as she brings uh, your word to us. Help us, our hearts, Lord, to uh, accept this and see the places where perhaps we are like the elders of Israel in our reactions. And help us, Lord, to truly not lean on our own understanding, but seek you in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, um, it's so nice to see some very familiar faces, but it's so nice to see some new faces too. Uh, and just to warn you, um, I am a professor at Temple University and I do archeology span and you're gonna hear about some of that today, <laughs> but there won't be a quiz at the end, <laughs> I promise. Um, okay, so uh, as teachers, we are sometimes surprised when we prepare to teach the, the chapter that we've been assigned all of a sudden this chapter has incredible relevance <laughs> in our lives. Uh, but I chose this chapter tonight, today because um, I knew how relevant these issues are today. And preparing me to lead uh, made me once again marvel at the unchanging freshness of the word of God. It's always ready to speak to our hearts if we let it in ways that make sense today, even if it was written thousands of years ago. So, we're going to 1 Samuel 8 this morning, um, and the setup for 1 Samuel chapter 8 is the end of chapter 7. All was well in Israel. Yahweh was king, ruling by the word of his prophet. The land is secure from the Philistines after a major military rout that was initiated by and won by the voice of God from heaven itself. The writer is making sure that we understand what happens next in chapter eight. It's a breach of trust, an exercise of self-will and rebellion. It's a senseless deed born of vanity to look like other human societies by demanding a human king. Now we're not told how many years have passed between chapter 17, verse 15 and eight chapter, uh, eight, chapter 8 verse 1 and that's not really important what is important is to figure out what this request for a king means and what's really important is how does this point to Jesus because that's what the old testament is about and we need to keep remembering that and then we'll look at why how this request for a king reflects on what's going on in our own hearts today so let me read the first nine verses with you and it came about when Samuel was old that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but they turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you've grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the other nations. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people and regard to all they say to you, for they have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds with which they, ha they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. So why did Samuel react so strongly? Did he feel a personal betrayal that people rejected him as judge? Did he feel that this request was against God's laws? What was the root of Samuel's indignation here? Was it a problem that Israel had, was asking for a king? Well, not entirely. And the answer to this question will take a little time and a little subtlety to answer. And I actually asked people to pray. I'll keep within the time limits because this is a very complex question. In Deuteronomy 7, 14 through 20, and I'm going to excerpt it here. 
Moses is telling the people what they must do when they enter the promised land. He gives them specific instructions about the feasts, how to celebrate them, how to set up the courts of law. And he says, when you enter the land of the, the Lord your God has given you and taken possession in it and settled in it, and you will, say, you will say, let us set a king over us like all the other nations around us, but be sure to appoint over you the king that the Lord your God chooses. So just as we have rules about the person that we can elect president, God gives up the Israelites some rules to follow about the king. The king has to be an Israelite. He must not acquire many horses. This is, this is um, a reference to the fact that it's very expensive to feed horses in Israel, given the climate where the, of, of this land. And so the, king, so the king is supposed to limit his income. That is, he's not supposed to be using a lot of extra money to feed his horses. Um, he must not take many wives. He must not accumulate a lot of silver and gold. He is to read the law every day. He's to have his, his quiet time every day so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of his law and those decrees and not consider himself better than his brothers. So we'll see how Samuel's warning had all of those provisions that were in Deuteronomy about a king. He had them in mind when he was talking to the people. And Samuel reflects an exasperation uh, about the people asking for a king. Maybe God himself felt a little bit of exasperation at this point, but God did foresee this request and he allowed it to occur but allowing it does not mean that he approved of it. And I want to um, talk to you about a parallel type of situation that is shown to us in Matthew 19, where the disciples asked Jesus about a particular law that Moses had given, which allowed or permitted a certain action to happen, although it was clear that Jesus was not in favor of this action. He wasn't entirely in favor of this action. When the disciples asked Jesus about it, it's, it's, it seems a contradiction to them. Jesus replied, Moses had given them the law because God knew about the hard hearts of the Israelites. And of course, we all know you can insert my own heart here. Um, and uh, this is the way uh, that God has permitted, although he would have preferred this situation to work out in a different way and a much harder way. When the disciples protested, no one would be able to fulfill the law that God had originally in mind. Jesus' response is, yep, that's right. <laughs> His life is and death is that yes, no one but he could completely fulfill the law. But again, my point is that permitting something is not approving of something. So we can perhaps understand Samuel's indignation. It's, it's a proper indignation that he views a fallen people who are trying to take control of their own lives, even after God has made a permanent covenant with them and shown them over and over again how he will take care of them. In verse nine, we see people asking for a king to judge them. And the warning is they're gonna get exactly what they asked for. You might be able to understand the position a little bit of the people that um, the, the Israelites, the position that they are in. They, they could remember that Eli's sons had been hopeless. And now it appears that Samuel's sons are not much better. So they're looking to the future and thinking, well, we're not even gonna have a prophet or a priest to help us here. But the hereditary passing of an office was clearly not working, um, at least for priests and judges. Um, you know, I say this even though we as Americans are all fascinated by hereditary rule. I mean, who among you has not looked at the crown, <laughs> a special on Princess Diana? Um, I need not go on. Um, we like to think that we can plan our future by thinking that we know who will be our rulers, even while we know in America the candidates for any office are flawed. Yet the story about Samuel's sons is placed here, that is it's placed here right at the beginning to, sh that, to show that even a man like Samuel after God's own heart cannot hand down power. Hereditary succession is dangerous to contemplate as there are no perfect sons who can rule perfectly 
just because they are the son of a righteous man. Well, we know from the other side of the working out of God's redemption that while this is true on the human level, it's not true on the divine level. There is one perfect son who can and does rule perfectly because he is the son of a righteous God. So let's move on to verses 10 to uh, 18. The warning that Samuel gives to the people, which God has told him to give. So Samuel speak, spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked him for a king. He said, this will be the procedure of a king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen, and they will run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and fifties and some to do his plowing and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and the vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. And he will take a tenth of your seed and your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. He will also take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and use them for his work. He will take a tenth of your flock and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out, to, cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. So the people had asked for a king in part because we're going to see it a little bit later. They wanted a king to lead them into battle. Samuel warns them that there is actually going to be a very heavy cost. It starts with their own children who will be drafted into his army and serve at the king's pleasure. Not this voluntary showing up when a judge calls them to appear. The runners before his chariot are the king's bodyguard. And the captains that they talk about will be part of an army that is not only called up for one season to fight, but they're gonna be part of a standing army. And everyone knows that a standing army has to be paid and that's gonna be paid by taxing the landowners. Other men will be brought into the service of the king to make weapons for the army or to work his lands, and even their daughters will be told, told to show up in the palace and be his cooks and textile workers and perfumers. The servants in verse 14 are courtiers in the royal court. They will have to be given grants of land in order to raise them to nobility. Land has to be obtained from somewhere in Israel, so certain Certainly the current landowners will have some of the lands removed from their possession to give to these new courtiers. And then the people are gonna be taxed an extra 10% on top of the tithe they already owe God. Well, these are very strong warnings and they're not warnings about an abusive king. They're about a king who acts the way that kings do. In Israel had kings all around them and they could see that this is what a king expected of his people. Samuel's trying to warn them about the cost of this governmental system. Look at the number of times he says, the king will take, the king will take, the king will take. And he finishes with a chilling summing up. God will not hear their cries for help if they find themselves under a king who abuses his power. All through the time of the judges, Israel cried out when they were oppressed by the people around them. But God is warning them there will come a time when oppression will come from their own king. And this time there will be no judge. There will be no heavenly army like there was in chapter seven. There will be nothing sent from God to destroy their enemy and give them relief. There will be no answer from Yahweh. And I don't wanna stop there because that's kind of like, that's awful. But um, <laughs> verse 19, let's go verse 19 through 22. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the, uh, all the nations and our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, after Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them again in the Lord's hearing. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. So we see Samuel here trying to give the people knowledge, but giving people knowledge does not mean they will choose to listen or act in the way they should. And anybody who's either been a kid or has a kid knows that. 
education may clarify what the problem will be, but it doesn't necessarily change the way that people feel about a problem. The people say they don't want another judge, they want a king. They want a leader who will give them all the pomp and circumstance that other nations have. They want a leader to lead them into battle. I, I don't know why they're asking this. The country is at peace at this point. But it appears the real reason is so that they will look like other nations. They want to call the shots. They want to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They want to be gods and plan their own political future. They want to skip the part where they repent of their sins and have to cry out to God for help and proceed immediately to a solution that they came up with on their own without asking God for direction. And when they brought the, uh, uh, just like when they brought the Ark of the Covenant to battle, trusting it as a mechanical means of victory without asking God if they should do this, they're doing the same thing here. They're plunging ahead with their own plan. They're, they're not seeking wisdom from the Lord. Now, Israel is not supposed to be like the other nations. They are not realizing that they are substituting a man's temporary and gaudy glory for the real true glory that resided in Israel. Samuel's words are simultaneously a curse, an oracle, and an instruction from the prophet. Israel was to be unique, just as we are to be unique and be different from the world. And the reason for this is because we follow a God who is unique who's different from all the other gods out there. As the writer of Hebrews says in 13, 13 and, and 16, the Israelites who had faith admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. They were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. So how on earth did the Israelites move from demanding a king to understanding that the country they were living in was not their true country? And what does this mean for us? people called to be unique in the world. Well, Israel's history under the kings tends to follow the same pattern as when they were under the judges. That is, for a while, under a good king, they would follow the Lord's laws. But then when a middling or a bad king would come along and take, uh, would take over, all of Israel would turn away from God and worship the gods they found in the societies around them. Remember how Yahweh used to pick the leaders of Israel, oftentimes ignoring the firstborn and even going for the youngest? That system has largely been lost uh, after it had it, it's lost after Solomon, as a matter of fact, as uh, hereditary kingships mean that if the oldest son does not ascend to the throne, there's a civil war. So here's where the history part comes in. Saul is anointed king a generation before 1000 BC, uh, roughly. For about 300 years, the country sometimes followed more closely and sometimes followed less closely the law, um, depending on which king was in charge of them. Even though the country was split into two competing kingdoms, there is one in the north and one in the south after Solomon. During this period, a descendant of David did sit on the throne, ruling over the southern kingdom only. In 722 to 720 BC, the northern 10 tribes were taken over by the Assyrians, who sent the Jews into exile out of the promised land. 250 years later, in 586 BC, the Babylonians defeated the last two tribes of Israel. They were living in the area around Jerusalem and keeping the temple and the, and the temple system intact. This is when the temple was destroyed. And as I said, the remaining tribes were sent into exile. They were also sent out of the Holy Land. So after 586 BC, there was no king in Israel, whether from the line of David or not. And there's no indication that God wanted the line of David reinstated by a, a human king one that will keep repeating the pattern of Israel follow, following them, falling away from God. Instead, Yahweh was putting in place a permanent solution, a better king than people could have imagined when they were asking for the king in Solomon's time. So what happens between 586 BC and the birth of Jesus is God preparing the world for the entrance of the true king, 
the mighty descendant of David. Now there were still a few poor inhabitants of Israel left in the area after the Assyrian and Babylonian conquest. People who conquer areas don't wanna bring the poor back with them because then they'll have to take care of them. So they leave the poor there. Um, but the, and these people remain under the control of the new conquerors, the Persians, until Cyrus the Persian allows some of them to return from Babylonia. And that begins in 538 BC. That is the people who came back, if they, uh, um, if they, if, if they came back and they would have been very old um, if they had remembered the time of, a, of the king and worship in the temple in Jerusalem. So God, God keeps almost complete generation in Babylonia, not remembering what it was like to live under a king. There are just a few people who came back who, I don't know if they could have remembered it, they would have been very young children. This group does begin rebuilding the temple. It becomes functional again, even if the glory of the Lord never resides there again. They did not have political autonomy. The leaders were appointed by the Persians and had to return there from time to time to report back to the Persian king. I will also tell you that more Jews stayed in Babylon than came back to Jerusalem. Another huge group of Jews had fled to Egypt before the Babylonians had laid siege to Jerusalem. So from about 586 BC onwards, clear into New, York, into New Testament times and even later, if you wanted to find the largest populations of Jewish people in the world, you would have to go to Babylon, where they lived under the authority of the Persian and then the Seleucid kings, or you could go to Alexandria in Egypt where they lived under the pharaohs. So what happens is that Alexander the Great conquers Jerusalem in 332 BC, and he begins a long line of Greek kings who rule the country that we know of as Israel, until the revolt of the Hashmoneans, who were a Jewish family, beginning in 166 BC. The revolt was eventually was partially successful, but the Jews living in Israel were still under the, the political control of the Greeks and eventually then the Romans, um, even if they had a high priest. This high priest was only appointed with the, um, uh, the okay of the Greek or the Roman ruler who was in authority. So the first king to arise in Israel after the Babylonian exile was Herod, who was born from an Idumean father that, um, who converted to Judaism and a Nabataean Arab princess. Herod was appointed king by the Roman Senate. So you can see why he reacted so strongly when the Magi show up. <laughs> they come looking for the king of the Jews and he's like, oh, excuse me, I thought I was. Um, there's no indication that Yahweh approved of any of these forms of government or any of these political systems. As I said, the glory was gone from the temple and except for a brief period when, the, when they're rebuilding the temple and Ezra and Nehemiah um, are doing the, the work of the Lord, the prophets are silent for about 600 years. But he did allow these things to occur. We're told by Matthew and Luke that Jesus was a descendant of David. The angel Gabriel tells Mary that her baby will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Yet at different points in Jesus's life, we are told that people didn't understand what this kingship meant. Jesus perceives when they want to make him king, he actually slips away from the crowd. That's in John six. When asked what should be the relationship between a good Jew and the government, Jesus acknowledges the government's authority over secular things, render unto Caesar in Mark 12. And finally, before Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world, it's from another place. You're a king then, Pilate answers. Jesus says to him, you are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason, I was born in John 18. So Jesus is the promised descendant of David who sits on the throne as king forever. But there's a twist. God did not appoint him to rule over an earthly kingdom, but a better heavenly one. So what do we do with our own government if we're subjects of the heavenly king? Well, thankfully, Paul, 
And remember, Paul had every reason to distrust the government that he was living under, makes this very clear in Romans 13. Let everyone submit to governing authorities since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. Now, Paul is not saying that every government or every leader in that government is following God. He is saying how we are to view the secular government that we live under so that the word of God can be heard by as many people as possible. But note that he says that the authority of the government does not exist from the authority granted to it by God. So we are not to hold any ruler or system of government as being bigger than God. Indeed, Paul goes on to write that if we rebel against secular authority, we are rebelling against what God himself has instituted. I, I'm not going to turn this into a Bible study on Romans 13 because that would take us hours. But um, instead, I'm going to be, I, I want to uh, say a little bit about how we are to, again, interact with the government and our leaders. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3, Paul tells us to pray for the king and all those in authority. Remember, in the Lord's Prayer, we are taught to ask God to bring his kingdom into being. We should pray for our leaders in government. We may participate in the government, but we should not make the mistake of seeing our government as having the same relationship to us as the king did with the ancient Israelites. In other words, leaders and governments today are sanctioned, they're allowed, they're permitted by God, but the type of government that Israel had as a unique chosen people with a special relationship to Yahweh did not exist after the exile in 586 BC. Instead, God spent the next 580 years preparing the world for a new king who would rule as priest and prophet and king. Now, the good news is instead of having to try to make an appointment with the king to have an audience, we can approach our king any time of day or night and have an audience with him. Our king is much more powerful king who, want, who rules over all things, but he does allow the secular governments to exist in order to bring peace on this earth so that everyone can hear the message of the gospel. Being allowed by God doesn't mean that the system of government we live under is, is the final solution to our problem, and we should not look to the political system to save us. We should pray for our leaders. We can certainly join the secular world to work for the betterment of the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the helpless. But we are never to mistake a leader for the real king who promises us that he will come back to rule and power at the end of days. But there's some more individual applications of this passage too. I don't wanna keep it up around this 10,000 foot level. Um, we can be a lot like the people of Israel here. And I'll start by pointing at myself. You can decide if you, you are too. I know I am called to be holy, and I know I am called to be different from this world, um, but how many times have I asked the Lord, just like, oh, okay, just this once, you know, maybe, I do I, can I conform to the world here? <laughs> um, I confess I actually like the world so, a lot of times. Uh, I don't wanna stand out and be different, yet we are to be holy because he is holy and he created us in his image. Israel forgot that when they asked for a king so they could be like the other nations. And I forget that when I don't uphold God's message and I just want to blend in. There's another way too. When I run into a problem, if I'm not trying to blend in, I often try to figure out the solution to the problem without asking for wisdom. Like the Israelites, it may be a mechanical solution. Their mechanical solution, bring up the ark, anoint a king. Um, it, it could be a problem I just haven't asked God about. In fact, if I do go to, go to God, I might be more interested in telling God how to solve the problem rather than uh, listening to him about how he wants to solve it. And sometimes, like a good parent, God will allow me to have my own solution to the problem, even though he knows a better one. In other words, he gives me what I want, sometimes to my great sorrow. Sometimes God shows his great kindness to us by not giving us what we want. God's better solution to the problems of the Israelites was shown in the birth of their true king, Jesus. But in the meantime, he allowed them to have the solution they asked for, a king, which they will find to be a much worse alternative than God's plan. I hope in your small groups, you can reflect on the goodness of God in sometimes answering our prayers 
in very different ways that we never imagined. And I hope you will also take time to thank him for listening to you and preserving you, even if you're asking for the wrong thing. But most of all, I hope you'll thank God for providing the perfect king while we're still on earth laboring under our government, which is allowed by God. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who guides us in our prayers for our leaders. So if you will pray with me now. Father, uh, we thank you for your eternal love and the unmerited grace you extend to us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to be our king. May we find comfort in these examples that we're reading about in 1 Samuel about how you worked with your people. And we always want to remember we have a savior who listens to us anytime we cry out. We pray for our leaders in government. For those who do not know you, we pray you'll open their hearts to hear your word. For those who do know you and have taken on the work of governing, we pray that they will trust you and not depend on their own understanding. We pray that they will seek your guidance, that they will become true servants. They will turn away from evil and do good, that they will be strong witnesses of you and your character. And we pray that you will strengthen these leaders and hold them up when they're discouraged. And for ourselves, we pray that we will learn to turn to you and not lean on our own understanding when we're faced with difficult, complex issues in our lives. We thank you that you are the source of all wisdom. Grant us patience and prayer and listening ears to hear your solution to our problems. We thank you that we can approach you because Jesus made it possible by dying on the cross and becoming our sin. I pray that you'll be with our small groups now as they all share together in a time of discussion and prayer. Amen.